Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Hammer Museum. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's program, In the Impact Zone. This conversation is part of our current exhibition, Breathe, Towards Climate and Social Justice. The exhibition is part of the Getty Citywide Initiative. Uh, I'm hearing some music in the background just for the AV folks. Um, this conversation is part of our current exhibition, Breathe. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the exhibition is part of this Getty Citywide Initiative called PST Art, Art and Science Collide, which developed exhibitions and programs all around Southern California focused on the theme of the intersection between art and science. The Hammer Museum's exhibition examines art practices that address the climate crisis and related disasters and their inescapable intersection with issues of equity and social justice. The Hammer exhibition is presented in partnership with Conservation International, and they've been very gracious in partnering, us, partnering with us on tonight's public program as well, so thank you. In the discussion tonight, we wanna to talk about the impact of climate change, pollution, overfishing, oil spills, and other human impacts on the health of the world's oceans. We're gonna hear from actis, activists and artists who are very engaged with these issues through their work. And they also all have something else in common. They surf. And the truth is that more than 75% of the world's best surf breaks are in areas where highly biodiverse ecosystems like coral reefs, coastal forests, and mangroves are in critical need of protection. So today we'll talk about the intersection of art and science and talk about how the surf community's deep connection to the ocean can be harnessed for innovative approaches to ocean conservation. Before we dive into tonight's discussion, I want to mention a related upcoming program we have planned on Sunday, November 17th. We're screening the documentary Chasing Coral, which follows a team of marine biologists and photographers as they document the rapid and unprecedented loss of coral reefs. That's at 11 a.m. next Sunday. Uh, just for the AV crew, I want to mention again, there is music playing inside the theater. Um, so please switch it up. So now I'm delighted to introduce our guest speakers, Glenn Kaino, Michael Jew, Scott Atkinson, and Chad Nelson. Glenn Kaino is a conceptual artist who works in sculpture, painting, filmmaking, performance, installation, and large-scale public works, as well as instigating collaborations with other modes of culture, ranging from tech to music to political organizing. He is also the co-curator with Mika Yoshitaki of the Hammer's current exhibition, Breathe, Towards Climate and Social Justice. Michael Jew is a conceptual artist featured in our current exhibition, Breathe, whose interdisciplinary work is rooted in an examination of perception. The works on display here are from his groundbreaking project, Organic Growth, Crystal Reef, or OGCR, and are a fascinating example of Jew's scientific approach to creating art. Scott Atkinson is a marine conservation specialist and the founder and senior director of Conservation International's Surf Conservation Program. He has over 25 years of experience working on nearshore and coastal conservation initiatives with a focus on Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands, especially in the Micronesia region of Oceania in the Western Pacific. Chad Nelson is the CEO of Surfrider Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to the protection and enjoyment of the world's oceans for all people. And Chad has led many high impact environmental campaigns that have resulted in healthier coasts from California to Puerto Rico. After today's discussion and Q&A, we'll have a chance to continue the conversation over some light refreshments in the theater lobby. And if you enjoyed tonight's talk and wanna stay updated on our upcoming programs and events, please feel free to sign up for our newsletter, which you can do out in the theater lobby or on the Hammer website. So now please join me in welcoming Glenn Kaino, Michael Jew, Scott Atkinson, and Chad Nelson. Thank you so much. Thanks, Claudia. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I'm just gonna start, it, it, the, the intros are funny because they always list all these things that you do. Uh, and and um, you know, I was like, I shall shorten that down. Uh, but I'm gonna add one today to, because I'm so excited to be here um, with, with, uh, with these, these folks. Um, 
junior amateur bodyboard uh, uh, competitor. Uh, and so I, I first started surfing when I was a little kid, <laughs> and I was on the junior circuit. Um, honestly, I'll say that I retired when I um, got elevated to the men's division when I turned 17 because um, I won a contest and I got not, uh, you know promoted because you're old and 17. And I was like, that's a man. <laughs> I'm a boy. Uh, there's no way I'm winning against any of these people. Um, but I've been in. I, I've spent uh, hundreds of hours in the water, um, and and I've always been a huge uh, fan of surfing and surf culture. And um, and also my first job, actually my second job, because the first, I technically I worked at Subway Subs for like a day, um, and they wouldn't let me be a sub a sandwich artist, so I quit. Um, but my first real job was at a fish store, um, and I was working on captive bred corals um, from 1988, and I became fell in love with the reefs. Um, and I was telling these guys backstage um, the politics of the reefs and important. I used that as a really thinking about it as a metaphor for our Asian diaspora and whatnot. And so I'm a big, huge fan of these folks to to to, to be in their company tonight. I'm excited for the conversation that we'll have. Um, I feel like it's a little bit of a lineup conversation, uh, you know, hanging out, waiting for a, a, a wave. But um, just quickly about about these three folks too. Like I've been a fan and 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 looked up to Michael for many many years um, as an artist. Um, he'll talk more about his practice. But uh, when we started to create the show, um, and Mika Yoshiaki is here right in the audience, um, you know, clap for Mika. Um, uh, you know, Michael's project OGCR um, is a full ecology and an ecosystem. Um, that I'm excited for him to to share with uh, you about, um, and then and then growing up, you know, I would see the Surfrider Foundation logo everywhere we'd go, and, and I'd always aspire to, you know, play my part and play a role, and you know, whether it's growing a little coral in my hobbyist fish tank and kind of learn more about that or figure it out. I was like, how does those how do those things work? And so when I first met Chad, um, you know, the questions I have for him tonight, you know, um, changed the way I think about a lot of not only my practice but um, activism in general and you know, I'm excited about that and then for, for Scott I did a forest project and some of you are from Conservation International um, CI yeah, since you're all collaborators now because you're with us you can leave and you can call it CI because like that's the cool way of say it. Uh, but huge fan of Conservation International all the work that uh, Scott has done as well um, so with that I want to start by just asking Michael to if you if you would talk about your work and describe uh, OGCR a little bit because that that's the piece that you all can see in the exhibition um, and uh, do you want to show the slides as well? Yeah, yeah. sure. Thanks, Gwen. Thanks for that introduction. I thought I would give a little bit of a context to some of what, you know, I have my own contribution to this uh, uh, really cool endeavor. Um, you know, really, really encyclopedic and interesting kind of approach to how science manifests in our projects. And, and for my own part, um, my own work deals a lot with, in the past, with material and how material kind of has intelligence or how material can, um, inter how we interface with artwork material or how it can have direct impact. I have a bit of a science background, but my science comes from growing up in a science household of agricultural scientists. So one of the versions of science is how it really has kind of a direct impact and rolls out um, from feeding people. Um, adding to that background, they um, my parents used, happened to be from uh, a divided Korea and um, came to the country after the Korean War. So I'm also kind of interested and familiar with um, the idea of impact on an environment and how that those kinds of environments also impact people. So some of the works I'll run through really quickly, just to give some background, are um, projects I'll describe swimming through 2,000 pounds of MSG <laughs> to performing a parody of evolution on the Bonneville salt flats on the GPS coordinates of where they first ran the, the Blue Flame record speed cars, an incredible linear process, and um, uh, to waiting in South Korea for elk, um, non-native elk, to lick salt off my body, waiting for 10 days to return that kind of idea of salt energy and expenditure into a bloodstream. Walking uh, the 400 mile length of the Dalton Highway, which is the feeder from Fairbanks up to Prudhoe Bay, against the flow of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline to try to determine the number of human calories per millisecond it takes a human to walk against the flow of those millions of years of fossil fuel. To you know, kind of sociologically oriented sculptures, say um, non-pack animals like coyotes um, gathered 50, 50, 51 as a matter of fact, coyotes all gathered together did this during an election year, um, all made in oil clay, which could be balled up then and remade into other works or, or take different forms. 
Um, 50 surveillance cameras, live security cameras positioned around the head of a Gandhar and Buddha that was in the relegated to storage in the Rockefeller collection, something you couldn't access. But I wanted to get you a little bit closer. But then replaying all of its broken imagery across hundreds of monitors and mirrors just to implicate and bring us all into the idea of how we put something back together in our own minds, how we can get closer to something as a group. Um, which kind of leads me up to um, really big jump into a project uh, very near to me and dear to me over the last few years that really transformed a lot of my practice and really informed and you know um, my own contribution here. But it's really a bit of a manifestation of a lot of the things I talked about. So in 2015, I started to get really excited about the idea of blockchain. I was teaching in uh, at Yale, where I teach in the MFA program. And some of my grad students started talking about something called crypto and blockchain. And you know, not only were they dabbling and paying for their own education, but they were changing their artwork from sculpture and objects into work about systems. They were starting to think differently. So I thought, this is really something to note in this generation or what's happening. Aside from the financial parts, it was, a kind of, it was a little bit of a distant thing that was a really a draw for a lot of people. But the idea was that, that it was changing their minds and changing their thinking was really interesting. So I sat with it for a long time. And in 2019, I had a chance to kind of develop a project, a digital project. Um, and it wasn't called an NFT to me at the time, but a blockchain project. And so I thought, how could I tackle this medium as I look more into it? it it's so, you know, transactional. It's so, it, you know, it's kind of, there's, it's kind of has this kind of uh, difficult relationship to um, environment, conservation, energy, and energy expenditure and carbon you know, production. So I thought, how can we do something that's positive if I can? So I thought maybe we could just tackle those direct head on more or less in a project. So um, I sat with a, co a collaborator that I pulled on board and we sat for, you know, basically a year uh, during COVID, the first year of COVID sitting in coffee shops in Greenpoint uh, at a distance talking about the idea of how to do that. And something I've been working on is crystals and crystal growth. So um, I got Daniil and I to, we worked on an algorithm together. How could we make something that's constantly changing and shifting, you know, something that's also elusive? And how could we t take that transactional head on? So we made an algorithm that takes all of the crypto wallet data or the user's information, you know, the moment uh, blockchain, a human interfaces with the blockchain, which is a timestamp and a crypto wallet, it has all these numbers. And that number would become a genetic code that would plug into what I kind of tried to teach Daniil about and crash, crash courses on with crystallography. So I wanted to take something that would take the crystal growth principles and use it as a, use the algorithm to generate a code that would make unique forms. So um, I had also been working with my son, um, uh, following him, actually watching him on uh, Discord servers at the time. And the Discord server community, which is the online community, is the kind of main channel for really kind of talking about and propagating NFTs. And on that, on that kind of Discord server channel, I was watching you know, enormous communities of scale get together and gather around an idea. And I thought that was a kind of interesting platform. It resembled a, a community of sorts. You know? So I got to thinking, well, with the crystals, maybe we could do something that was very community-based. And something that was really interesting to me that's a, a place and a thing is a coral reef. So I thought perhaps we could take these crystals and utilize the crystals that are primarily used in coral reef exoskeleton production and use that as the basis for making these unique forms. So we released 10,301 of these crystals that were then also geared to kind of defy transactional data and they would basically keep changing. So for three months the crystals kept changing and they couldn't be identified as rarity so they kind of defied a market. But more importantly, they grew a community. And that community um, was talking and talking about environmental issues. And they were talking about what was possible with these coral forms because we wanted to keep that at the front. And the ecosystem that Glenn is talking about that I was so interested in generating was something that I thought maybe we could make a project that would grow horizontally and utilize this NFT just as a starting point, that it wouldn't be the artwork itself, but that, in effect, it would become this hub can this video play by any chance? Maybe here again. Yeah. So we started to take the NFT into different directions. And so among the many things when we were talking about the crystal, uh, developing the project was the idea that we'd have a direct relationship to um, coral reef research and conservation. So 
along the way from the outset, I thought maybe we should try to pair with several labs so we could have a sustainable relationship, not just an offset kind of relationship. So among the labs that we met, we were able to kind of donate uh, philanthropically to Scripps um, uh, Institute of Oceanography to the Jen Smith Lab, as well as the Benthic Invertebrates Lab. So the, com the community had this very strong engagement, was actually live and involved in kind of developing all these relationships and participating in naming a species, et cetera, et cetera. And along the way, I also met another kind of lab partner called the Mega Lab, which is a group of, I guess, professional surfers and surfers, amateur surfers, but all who were legitimate scientists affiliated with the University of ha uh, Hawaii Hilo, but who were collectively working together on their own dime to kind of help to develop and image reefs um, and message um, a different way to make science possible. And so I got together with them, and among the other horizontal outcomes, you know, like uh, giving all the commercial rights to the project to a community of holders, a DAO, who then, you know, took all royalties of up, you know, $600,000 to a million dollars to control it to make their own art projects. They're funding art projects independent of us now on the, on the digital arena, as well as trying to make um, uh, steps that were horizontal um, into the environment. So John Burns, who you see on the left, is the, kind of arguably the head of the Mega Lab, um, got together with Cliff Capono, a pretty well-known surfer, I think these guys know, um, who is an incredible um, molecular biologist. And um, John, a data scientist, um, said, well, maybe we could take these forms after our conversation and study them in the ocean. And John was really interested in the idea that these were generating randomness, which is so hard to generate. So there was a kind of randomness factor, but within a parameter of crystals. And maybe we could start to um, utilize those in undersea environments to study the idea of uptake and coral propagation. So we began planting the um, crystals in a very limited basis off the Kona coast to study their uptake. And they've successfully, after every kind of couple of weeks, we've been recording the information and getting calcified coral to grow with the purposes of eventually, hopefully, gaining some insight and observational research onto the idea of how we can create a, a kind of idea of prosthesis and an idea of how to kind of assist on a real level, but not add anything to the ocean, use this as something that we could use as a kind of knowledge and, and information kind of data collection. And what we see now, jumping ahead, is a, an image of what we'll see upstairs, what's on show. And I'm only putting this forward because this is basically what we're seeing is a lot of the data information and a lot of the videos and live cameras and um, gathered uh, video, videography of the crystal site along with the um, uh, kind of uh, uh, history of the piece according to its community. So we'll see the Discord server in this, as well as imagery from the underwater environment, as well as the data, um, the NFTs themselves. But in this work, it's governed by an AI. So I wanted this to kind of continue to grow and show itself. So as the coral, as the NFT project continues to grow, you know, the opportunity to show this moment of where it's at is what this piece is about. So I show some examples of 3D printed crystals but also, more importantly, this kind of narrative that's really generated by AI that basically tells us how a, the project is being um, kind of unfolding in the environment as well as in the digital community. Um, yeah, and so uh, the full ecology of the idea and creating the community, creating some artwork, you know, and then having that um, actually create Mobile, mobilize resources you know, into action, I think, is something that was at the root of what we learned when Mika and I were first doing interviews to think about how we wanted the show to work. And, and um, you know, for, for Chad, you, you know, when we had, Chad was one of our advisors as well when we started thinking about the show. For about a year, we met with advisors. And um, you said too many things for me to bring up today, but there's two of them <laughs> that really fund fundamentally sort of stuck with us in terms of thinking about cr creating the exhibition. Um, and, and, and one of them was um, uh, the, you, you talked about the difference between how people approach um, climate issues. And, and you said, in, in, and I'm going to butcher this, but that's why you're here. <laughs> you, you said in one capacity, there are a group of behavioralists that want people's behavior to change. But there are other people who want to invent themselves out of problems. Yep. 
you know, when we, Mika and I thought about that in terms of the artwork that we were seeing produced, you know, um, Michael's is an example of a full ecosystem, but there were artists and there are art projects that um, are, are more linear, scholarly, didactic in a way, and they, they, their contribution, let's say, is um, inspiring at a knowledge production level, you know, wh- where, where um, they, they become precedents, right, in, in a lineage of thinking that can change. There are other artists who just make so gut-punching, beautiful, impressive, amazing works that you feel like a Roji Ikeda piece, like something you just, you know, it's called the point in return, you feel it, you know, and, and you're like, okay, well, there's different approaches and, and what you talked about, you know, um, I think Peloton was one of the examples, but you talked about that, so I wanted you to ask about that. I want to ask you about that, but uh, there's other things to tee up for both and because and, okay. uh, they're both awesome. Um, the other thing that I find when we think about climate change and, and, and change in general is that, particularly for climate, um, outside of the human time scale, it's difficult for people to actually uh, uh, think about the um, fruits of their effort, you know, and it's sort of demoralizing in a way to think that you might be doing something that is so hypothetical that in many generations we'll see change, right? Um, but Chad, one of his uh, numerous projects that Claudia referenced was, you know, he, he led a campaign to save the surf break trestles, which is dear to my heart and a lot of surfers in California's heart, um, that it happened in our lifetime and under our watch to be conscious and able to process it. And so how does it feel to be able to do that? Can you describe that and then use that as a lead in to talk about the behavioral? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I just this week <clears throat> was down surfing at trestles, which is right on the Orange County, San Diego County border. Um, it's one of the only intact watersheds in Southern California, so it drains from actually wilderness area down to the ocean, so you can surf there after it rains and not get sick. Um, it's the fifth most visited state park in California and full of uh, endangered species. So it's really, this is a gem, and has a world-class surf spot. It's a, a gem of a place. And I was down there surfing the other morning, soaking it all in, and um, you know, I had this thought, thank God we saved this place. And on one hand, what's funny about it is um, we fought a 15-year campaign, which seemed really long at the time, but it was within my lifetime. Um, And uh, it was a campaign we were told we weren't going to win. It's a state park. It's governed by the California Coastal Commission. It's part of a Navy base, and they wanted to cram a six-lane private toll road through it, destroy a campground, destroy the wetlands, destroy the surf spot. And um, when we were first approached, it was on the maps already, Arnold Schwarzenegger was the governor. He had approved the project. And we were told that it was unwinnable and we should just uh, give up because it's a waste of energy and time. And uh, there's a guy at Surfrider, Matt McLean, who I'll forever be indebted to, who had one of those fist pounding on the table moments where he said, we are the Surfrider Foundation. This is a world-class spot in our backyard. If we're not gonna fight this fight, we should just pack up and go home. And he was right. Um, And One of the beautiful things about that campaign was that all of the odds were against us. Um, The surfing community, despite our decades of organizing, still can be a little lackadaisical about focusing on conservation. Uh, But we were able to rally thousands and thousands of people. So they had a Parks Commission meeting, largest in history ever attended. They had a Coastal Commission meeting. I think 3,000 people showed up. They had to keep changing the venue. I call it the Woodstock of surfing conservation because there were people in costumes. There were bands playing. There were posters. It was a celebratory win. Uh, And then it got appealed to the U.S. Commerce, which was the highest level, federal level, and I think 3,500 people showed up. Uh, And it was one of the best demonstrations in my career of the power of people. And we, we know this because we see this happen, you know. Um, Standing Rock is another example. Uh, it is incredible. And I, it, what I took away from that is we can do anything if we have enough people on our side, which is something we're going to have to start doing right now again, uh, by the way. Um, and um, it was about organizing people around a place they loved uh, to protect it, you know, for future generations. You know, I, I raised my kids surfing down there. I hope they can raise their kids. We layered even more protection on top of that spot. This is something Scott can talk about. Uh, no place is ever saved. A very famous coastal activist, uh, Peter Douglas in California said, uh, the coast is never saved, it's always being saved. 
So you can put all the laws and policies you want on a place, but if the local community isn't there to defend them, it's still at risk, and this is a case of that. Um, so it's something we're super proud of. Um, it also had one of the best marketing campaigns ever, because it was all like punk rock themed, you know, never mind the Bullocks, save trestles. Um, so it tapped into culture in a way that was relevant, uh, made it cool. Um, and uh, so that was, you know, that was this idea of changing behavior. And what I was talking to you about is I think that there's two predominant worldviews, maybe in conservation, but generally, and one is the builder and the other is the behaviorist. And we know the builder, um, they're the Elon Musks, Yvonne Chouinard, who invented clean climbing gear, people who want to invent things to solve problems. Uh, the Ocean Cleanup Project, uh, which is the giant Roomba in the ocean to clean up the plastic pollution, um, they want to build their way out of the problems. Um, they tend to be pro-business, entrepreneurial, have sort of a, a cornucopian view of the world, that it's there's an endless abundance of supply. Um, it's a way of thinking. Most conservationists are what I would call behaviorists. Uh, they don't want to add technology. They want to change how we do things. They want to change behavior. And how do we change behavior? We usually do that by passing laws. Uh, so they want to pass policies and laws or win legal arguments. So you know, how do we stop people from dying on roads? We set a speed limit, we add stop signs, and we say you can't drink and drive. Those are all laws that change behavior. Um, they tend to look at the world as wholly connected and also um, limited in supply, not cornucopian. And so you have this conflict where you have the titans of industry who have all the money and resources building, and you have the conservationists over here trying to change behavior. Building's fun, changing behavior's not so fun. <laughs> Uh, but there's very few examples where we built our way out of things. It almost always requires behavior change. And I think the one thing that's interesting is that the behavior changes actually drive, ultimately, the entrepreneurs in the building. So they're not mutually exclusive. It's just that the behaviors have to come first, right? Why are we moving to wind and solar instead of fossil fuels? Because we started setting rules that tilted that the favor towards that, and it's about to roll off the hill, despite what happens in the in January, because those are now the cheapest sources of electricity. But it needed the impetus through behavior to change, and now the innovation is taking care of it. So that was this concept, because I spent a lot of time thinking, why are we looking over here? These are not real solutions, but that's where all the money and excitement is, when the real solutions are over here, and everyone's like, oh, you're those boring environmentalists. We don't want to see you at the cocktail party. Exactly. <laughs> uh, um, well, I have another question, but we'll get back to that one in our, in our, in our loop. Um, Scott, so, so I've had, the, again, uh, proudly calling myself part of the CI family now. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'd say one of the things I, I did work with uh, um, the NRDC before, and, and I, I found when I, in that early research of my coral projects that the ocean is the least invested in natural resource, you know, and, and largely because out of sight, out of mind. People think it's so vast and big. Of course, it heals itself, but fish population, coral, you know, safety. Um, what are the, what, you know, you, you work with and on some of the breaks that produce the corals that you know, I got as kids. And I remember being terrified uh, about the state of corals, you know, in 1988 and, and, you know, putting calcium drips into my coral. Please, can I, as a kid, make this coral and somehow get it back into the ocean? You know, wh what are the processes and how do you tackle something so challenging and enormous? Uh, thank you. So um, before I answer your question, I just want to say that long before I knew him, Chad Nelson was one of my heroes for what he and Surfrider and so many other people achieved at Trestle. So let's give him and Surfrider a round of applause, you know, because um, that these are the early days of surf conservation. I mean, it goes back much before then, but we took inspiration from the people who fought, you know, who fought the fight, who said, we are losing waves, we are losing marine ecosystems, we are losing these places at a rate that is just unacceptable globally. And, and you know, now we talk about we're in the make or break decade where the worst impacts of climate change are coming. If we don't uh, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and if we don't adapt, um, we will have those worst impacts. So. Uh, not to be a bummer, but the, the great part of that is that 30% of the, 
of the climate crisis can be addressed by nature. So I'm an eternal optimist. I was just in Sumba in Indonesia where we were uh, teaching young people in our work to create surf protected areas. We were teaching young people to surf and to learn how to do conservation and we were doing it in one of the most pristine, incredible, beautiful environments, live coral cover that you couldn't believe, a mangrove that unfortunately was cut but is now being restored. And um, so you said it, Glenn, the, the, the ability of the ocean to restore itself is beyond belief if we give it that chance. And the reality is, is that people can have more fish, more income, more fun, and a better life by managing their ecosystems. But we have these kind of perverse incentives like let's build a six lane highway through one of the best, most irreplaceable places on the planet. Um, I'm gonna tell a little bit about we, what we do in just a sec, but before I do that, I just wanna say another thing to you, Michael. I didn't know Michael before tonight, but he was installing those coral crystals with scientists in Hawaii in a place that I spent 24 years trying to create a community-based subsistence protecting er protected area in South Kona. We got it last year. Yeah, I had no idea that there was this incredible artist, you know, creating a, a beautiful way for the rest of the world to engage in this place where a local community is working to protect its reefs. And I'm just blown away by the synergies that we have together here on this stage and with all of us. Um, so what we do is at Conservation International Surf Program is we create protected areas around surf breaks. Um, we use the, we work with the passion of the surfing world and the surfing community. Um, some of our supporters who got, who saw it from the very beginning and said, oh my God, that's an amazing idea because surfers love the ocean and people protect what they love. So if we can get, get these people with the resources they need, the funds, the resources and know-how, they can protect these incredible places all around the world. And so I'll just tell one quick story and we'll go to more conversation. We started with a very small grant from our early supporters, some of which are in the room, so shout out to them, a round of applause to them. Um, we went to the island of Moratai in Indonesia, which is one of the most pristine places in the world. The Indonesian government said, we wanna put, a go from 7,000 visitors a year, we're gonna get a million new tourists. If you've been to Bali or know about Bali, you know it's overrun with tourists. Beautiful place, but overrun. We're gonna go from 7,000 to a million. You can imagine the destruction in four years. They didn't get a million tourists. They got six grubby, dirty surfer biologists who wanted to create the world's first surf, surf protected area. That was four years ago. Today, we have created 22 surf protected areas on this island. The corals are flourishing, they're incredible. And in four months, we'll create 25. There's 25 villages on this island that have great coral and great waves there'll be 25 surf protected areas and this will become the first island in the world where every wave, every coral reef, every mangrove, every coastal forest and every beach is protected by the people who surf there, live there and love it. And that is four years of work. All inspired by people like you. So thank you. Um, that's amazing. Well, going back to our green room conversation, and I have a follow for everyone, but uh, Chad, you had mentioned the corollary between serving and art, you know, about people you love. And can you can you elaborate on that or tell us about that? Yeah, like, saving I mean, things uh, that you, you, know. you know, first of all, it's a pleasure to share the stage with with all of you. I mean, we, we got along like a thick as thieves instantly, <laughs> despite being conceptual artists and it's kind of like nerdy science conservation yeah. guys. Um, and I think that's just sort of like a, a combination of this like reverence for for nature and like understanding these systems and people and and, and a love for the ocean. Um, but you know, uh, conservation and tackling climate change is daunting stuff. They're big problems. It's easy to have them feel overwhelmed and just shut them down and turn them off. Um, and I think we're looking for sort of different ways to enter that conversation and shake people out of their everyday thinking and maybe get them to think differently and be motivated. And so this is something art does, right? You guys come at things in a way that's different and it's fascinating and it shakes up our thinking, which is why we love art. And so the fact that you're sort of using your superpowers uh, to, to get people to think maybe a little bit differently about climate change. And that's kind of what Scott and I are doing with surfing, right? Who, you know, 
who would ever think that like the surfers on this island were like the the ultimate conservation champions? It's like this unlikely hero. Um, and so I think we're trying to use surfing, which is you know people are fascinated by. It's fun. It's exciting as an angle into into these conservation and climate challenges. So it turns out that it's perfect to have artists and surfers yes. on the stage <laughs> talking about conservation. That's what I think anyway. Uh, that's what I think too. I think we got to do a Hammer Museum sponsored surf trip somewhere. Uh, <laughs> but but um, and 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 um, I question for all three of you. But we'll start with you, Michael. Um, you know, sometimes the work. I mean, you said the work's daunting. It's hard. Sometimes there's compromises that need to be made for the greater goal and the greater good. Uh, and, and you know, I, I know that we all started talking about NFTs today, blockchain stuff and, you know, um, credits, you know, uh, climate credits. And, and, and one of the things that we've had to answer to, and I'm very proud to, to do it on, on your behalf and our behalf, is the question about NFTs you know, using digital technologies in innovative ways. Um, I, I, I have a personal response, but I want to ask you first, or maybe I'll, I'll share mine first, just because, you know, I, we, we've often gotten questions about the um, contradiction, let's say, of using something that is known in popular consciousness to be challenging for the environment because of the power use, you know. And, and um, I, I, I so warned you, I will get emotional telling the story because I do every time. But I had a friend uh, who in... Uh, 2004 ish, I guess 2004, um, 2003. Um, Netflix was still mailing DVDs at the time. Uh, it was not a streaming service, um, and ESPN was not streaming games yet um, or sports events. And and they were about to do that. And and but the um, the world uh, in media responded in saying, "You can't do that because it's going to cost so much electricity and so much energy. It's going to ruin the world. It's going to you know be so bad for the environment." Because at the time. Um, like the ESPN servers, let's say, were in Connecticut in the East Coast. And if you wanted to watch a game uh, in Los Angeles, the data would have to go through all those telcos all the way through, and everything went through Texas and these big things. And, um, and, and you know, you can imagine if it's, it's popular, you streaming movies, that would cause a lot of electrical usage. Um, and a friend of mine named Danny Lewin uh, created a concept called uh, a company called Akamai, and he created the concept of caching. And he said, "Hey, look, if everyone's going to stream the same game and they're all in LA, let's just go stream the game once to LA, and all the people in LA will just stream it from LA." This is a novel concept, and it's a very simple concept, but it didn't exist before Danny. I say emotional because he passed away in 9/11, flying out to see me. Um, but his company indeed changed the internet. And what happened was he was provoked by a problem that society offered, which was. We want to stream movies. We want it. We want to go see our sports games, and we want to use the internet for real time stuff. He was in grad school at MIT at the time, uh, and then he figured it out. You know, he came up with a solution. And and I, uh, when I you know sort of defend our use of NFTs or our use of alternative technological models, I said you know there's a short term and a long term play here, right? And and you know um, just from the nature of scholarship and and you know um, the the knowledge production, you know it is you know, irrefutable that distributed knowledge production is in our future. Like nothing is just the banking model of one scholar creating something. Communities are are building information now. Uh, and, and so I say that, you know, right now there's a grad student probably at UCLA or MIT or somewhere who's, you know, loves Michael's work and loves the blockchain, wants to build an NFT to go save a wave, but understands that there is a short-term ec uh, ecological consequence of that, meaning more power. And they are already evolving NFTs, you know, to 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 be more, you know, um, cost and energy energy conscious. But you know, for me, that's a a short um, example of some of the you know compromises that one has to make in 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 the process of doing that. And so, well, how do you you know how, did you think about that when you started the project, or how does that work into this conversation? Uh, yeah, we definitely I definitely thought of it. It was in the kind of DNA of the whole project for sure. I mean, it was I was wrangling, you know, wringing my hands a lot over the idea of doing this project. But you know, it's really enlightening to kind of hear the models of you know uh, behavioral and uh, types of uh, you know um, solution uh, driven problems. You know, and so I was really interested in the idea that maybe this uh, community of scale and the idea of the NFT could perhaps be used. You know, in its own terms, to kind of rethink our thinking about it. At the time, NFTs and art, you know, still really embattled territory, just as on the art front, let alone the kind of environmental issues. And so, for me, the idea that this thing of scale, you know, at, at its greatest, our, our community talking about coral reefs, talking about um, crystallography, talking about how coral reefs are made, you know, naming a species, 
um, learning about these other labs and other efforts to conserve coral reached about 80,000 people online. You know, I never, I don't think I've had an art show where 80,000 people have been <laughs> to my art show. But in this conversation, across 24 languages, operating 24 hours a day, they were talking about the issue, among other things. I mean, they were talking about, you know, how lint builds up under their drawers. You know, there's, you know, there are rocket scientists and there are kids living in their basement all in the same place. And I came to feel that NFT was like a campfire. It was almost like a place to gather and a place to kind of grow a culture. And maybe that space was a healthy potential space. Maybe the NFT itself isn't the solution, but perhaps rethinking and using it as a model in other ways might have been a way, a way forward. And so, you know, it's also influenced the way I think because, you know, digital technology is dynamic. Nature is dynamic. The planet's dynamic. One of the things just to what you guys were both saying is that I learned that was so impactful to me was, you know, from John Burns over at the Mega Lab was that we aren't studying, you know, coral reef destruction and environmental, you know, the impact of humans on them. We're studying resilience. You know, we're studying that these things are really doing well and healthy and it's possible for the planet to do well. That's not to say that we don't have to, you know, do our part, but I think that's a very interesting line of, you know, of thinking. And so that kind of idea of uh, it being using digital technology in a forward, positive way was really intriguing to me. So, I mean, that's just the beginning of that, that question. But what I thought was maybe going forward, this thing that we created un underwater, this thing that we're starting only, you know, this kind of little, little experiments that we're doing. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty odd to be on stage with people that make things happen that have actually done it, you know, in a lifetime, you know. I'm in a, in a field where I, you know, we work kind of, you know, a little bit separate from things, but about big ideas and small observations and try to make those things, you know, impact someone on an individual level potentially, maybe on greater levels. But, you know, it's really pretty amazing that it can actually impact something like the planet itself and then our thinking about it. So um, that said, um, our own contribution within this project might be, you know, can we also use what these NFTs themselves or the nature of digital technology and communication also kind of um, enables, which is, um, you know, funding and support and finance. So maybe the NFT that was so successful in the economic realm and as a, as a, as a kind of, you know, uh, a conversational art entrance into digital technology could also then uh, do the same thing in nature. So even as we grow these models underwater, um, every month, we, you know, the goal, you know, we haven't gotten there yet, but the goal would be, can we, you know, develop the right material, not necessarily plastic, which is why we're taking slow steps um, as material develops, but experimenting with things like um, printing um, um, stone, printing calcium carbonates, things that are a little more um, organic and ocean friendly. And as we develop that and put these down, maybe the dream can be to put down, you know, a thousand of them to research that in a limited field. Um, with the goal that each of those then might become um, a digital model and recorded and then become an NFT potentially that then funds the research itself, you know, to create these sustainable loops, to create um, funding for the grad students that, that do support the science, that support the coral reef research, that support this particular, you know, avenue. Or yeah, that's cool. You know, I think this like duality of the NFT thing is kind of true for so many things, right? And I mean, for us, the Trussell's example and our grassroots organizing and our work is about spreading ideas and getting as many possible people involved. You know, the big corporations have the money, we have the people. So it's about organizing at the end of the day, I think is fundamental to the work that we're trying to do. And so you think about like this NFT model and your project and you've built this community that has all this genuine interest in self-organizing around that. So I'm thinking if I could get people to self-organize around conservation and scale that to the scale we need to actually solve the problems we have, that's a huge win for us. Now, there'll always be someone out there like playing pump and dump, short-term games, making up fake cryptos and scamming NFTs, right? There's, so there's gonna always be this sort of like used car salesman version of the world, I think, and that's kind of what we've seen. It's tarnished the whole industry, but you, know, you were kind of implying, I think some of the fundamental sort of building blocks and concepts, but, but you know, I think if we're patient, we'll see, you know, now crypto is playing, you know, a finance game is a big part of the election. So it's like, it's a mess over here, but there's um, other parts of this that are like incredibly fascinating. And that's where I think Michael work like yours, where you're coming at it from this kind of very conscious, uh, thoughtful way is of great value. Cause it's, that's the, you know, 
I wish I was that kind of creative thinker. I'm more of a practical doer guy. So there's tons of value in that in my mind. And I'm, it gets my brain thinking about like how we can use the good of that model to try to scale the stuff we're trying to do to make millions of surf protected areas, not just dozens. Yeah. But in, and in the, you were talking about possibly doing that already, right? Like, or doing an NFT? Yeah, yeah. So um, we have a very practical example where we wish we had a world famous artist with 80,000 followers <laughs> <laughs> to promote our work, um, which is using NFTs to essentially to do a carbon credit. Uh, I'm sorry, a biodiversity credit. We've all heard of carbon credits. They're traded. Um, there's challenges with that. But um, in the last couple of years, Conservation International has working, been working on biodiversity credits and the island nation of Niue, Pacific Island Nation, a small nation without any real tourism, without any real economy that could fund protection of their coral reefs, they declared all the coral reefs in the area of the island as a, as a protected area. And they said, well, how are we going to fund this? And they came up with the idea of doing a biodiversity credit where each person on the open market could buy an NFT that would be associated with a, with a meter of reef. And um, that, that's, that's trading now. Um, we can send you the website so you can buy your NFT. Um, but, but I mean, God, I wish I had known about the project before tonight or before I saw the exhibition because that promotion is what we sometimes struggle with, right? And so you need every, like Chad said, you need every aspect of society because this could take off. Um, these could become very valuable and tradable. And in the meantime, every time they're traded, they're funding coral reef conservation. So the idea is brilliant. The idea that you had related to the art and, and this, and we just need to bring it all together and, and see how we can do that um, for many, many places in the world. This is an emerging market inspired by art, inspired by the need to fund these incredible places. So yeah, I think there's a lot of positivity there. And yes, uh, we need to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions associated with it, but we're working on that separately. And um, in the meantime, we have calculated the carbon footprint of selling those NFTs at a new way, and it will uh, the benefit for biodiversity will ex far exceed the f carbon footprint. So, and you have there's ways to offset that as well that we're working on. Um, that's fantastic. Well, because um, when I first went to your Discord, because. I was working on an NFT project, a separate one about social justice in different ways, um, and and Michael was my my um, tour guide through through uh, the, the NFT Discord, and I logged in and I saw fifteen thousand people active at one moment talking about coral reefs. I was like, this is like this is like my childhood dream: technology, computers, corals, um, all in one place. Art, um, no, and and I thought that right then, like you know, despite all the chatter about you know the greenhouse emission and the NFTs, you know, th there is a person here who is thinking about solving these problems because the energy that they had, you know, that you see in the exhibition with the discord conversations going, you know, th that it's a, it's a contagious energy, you know, that is all exciting and fun and, and, and very positive. And I, and I think about that when I think of 3,500 people showing up at a city council meeting or whatever, you know, in bands and, you know, it is a sort of a, a people powered, you know, um, movement in that way. Um, so question for, for, for the surf guys in, in, in a way, in, in, in because of the, we're talking about scalability and, and then we'll get to an audience, audience question or whatever. But so we're talking about scalability, and I asked this it, it, in the back a bit, which was um, the excitement about art and, and surfing, um, totally see creating passion about work and making that fun and, um, you know, uh, inspiring. Uh, but uh, waves are actually incredibly limited resources. Like good waves and good surfing is limited by, you know, nature, you know, and the ability for storms to create waves and energy and um, there's a lot of territorialism in, in there and how, how does it work how, how have you have you thought about that in terms of like the inverted relationship with them the idea that you need to bring more people under the tent to, to care about it but only they can't all get the good waves because the more people you bring in the less resources there are to share in, in some capacity yeah i mean i think one of the points like uh, that you make is if you think about the 327,000 miles of coast on the planet. There's a lot of coastline. And there's a wave breaking on that those coasts every like eight to 10 seconds. So the number of waves breaking like around the earth at every like moment is unbelievably, it's like, you know, it's like grains of sand on the beach. Um, but 
the ones that are good for surfing, the ones that are really good for surfing, any surfer like me or Scott can just name them all for one thing. Um, and you know, I could probably name most of the ones in California. There's, they're very few. And that's because the confluence of the underwater topography, whether it's rock or sand or coral reef, the waves, the swell direction, the wind, all these things need to come together like just perfectly. And even at the best surf spots like trestles, that only happens maybe 25% of the time. Um, so there's just, it is an incredible, it's an endangered species, right? It's this rarity that we sort of like define our lives around. Um, and they're incredibly sensitive to change. One foot of tide can make a surf spot good or bad. Um, and so they are rare. Um, and there's it, particularly in Southern California and other Australia, these places, it's super crowded. And there's a, it's actually kind of amazing. There's an unspoken sort of set of rules out there that all those people sort of abide by. And there is violence sometimes and localism and people are shocked by that. I'm actually shocked that it happens so infrequently. So, you know, there'll be a hundred people out there and then there's like three waves every 15 minutes for them to catch. So they're all scrambling for that same resource. So that's the problem you're talking about. I do think that there's sort of like a sort of Western capitalistic, like I got to get mine attitude to that. And I do think that there's a possibility to like, and you see this, I think, particularly with surfers that are out there a lot, not all of them, uh, that we can flip that to be turned into generosity. I've gotten mine. I've been surfing out here uh, my whole life. Look at this new person. Why don't I welcome them in? Why don't I share this precious resource, you know, kind of the same way certain cultures like give gifts when they meet. And so I would love to see, this is my sort of maybe naive fantasy is that we can flip this thing on its head, sort of slowly change that culture from I'm going to get mine and take it and, uh, and actually become generous. But, um, that said, there are a lot of waves out there that you can still learn. And you, if you travel the world, you can find empty waves, which Scott does probably better than I do. But um, so, I, you know, I, I'm hopeful. Uh, and, you know, at this point, just any time in the ocean is a gift for me. It doesn't matter how many waves I catch. You can't get all the waves all the time, <laughs> but you can get some really good waves a lot of the time. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, what we do with we, uh, as I was mentioning, I just came back from Sumba, Indonesia. We were doing a surf conservation camp, teaching the joy of surfing, teaching the connection to nature, giving people a chance, young people a chance to fall in love with the ocean through surfing, and also learn that it's a gift. And it's a gift that can go away really quickly. It's a gift that was took millions of years to be here for us. And um, it can it can be gone so quickly. I mean, we all have stories, you know, of waves that have been lost in our lifetimes or diminished way past you know, the desire to go out there. But to me, it's more about the surfing experience. It's, you know, the quality of the wave is important, but the quality of the surfing experience. You know, we want to be surfing in an environment that is beautiful, that is thriving. We want to be surfing where the, com the, the communities on shore aren't struggling with food security and poverty. Um, you know, not to where their coastal land has all been sold and, and the development is such that they go from owning a resource they didn't even know how valuable it was, valuable it was to owning, to being, you know, maybe workers in a hotel. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a struggle. It's like you said, it's, um, um, you know, conservation is never done. It's constant. But the beauty is, is we've had really great success. We've had these really good successes. And what we just need to do is more of it, more of it, more of it, more of it. So with that in mind, um, we're working, you know, um, our footprint is small. We only started five years ago, but we're working on a global action plan. Um, we're working on a toolkit to help uh, people support people in throughout the world. They can do surf conservation in their areas. Um, we're working to support local communities to develop the means so that they can own the tourism facilities. They can develop that. Um, so it's, I mean, we, we, you know, if, if I could flip a switch and do it instantly, we would have, it's 4,800, by the way, that are mapped. So you said you can name every wave. We've got them on the map. 4,800 is the ones we know about. Um, <laughs> world class. World class. Uh, I don't know. I have to check that database. <laughs> but, um, but we keep some secret also. You know, we don't tell. <laughs> and Chad has a lot of secrets, I'm sure. But, um, but 
we can we can do this as a global community. We we actually projected how much it would cost a year if we were to try to manage and protect all the waves of the world. And um, I, don't quote me on this, but I think it's about eighty to one hundred million U.S. dollars a year. That is not very much. Yeah. Do that over ten years. I mean, you know, it doesn't stop then, but you could get ecosystem-based conservation around the majority of the, the the great waves of the world. And you know, we'll check those numbers and we'll come back to you. But it is it is a doable proposition. There is no doubt about it. Scott, surfing seems a little bit trite, right? In the in the um, scheme of global warming and the ecosystem destruction, um, but. Tell tell us about the research. There's it, it actually isn't that trite because, yeah. Thank you, Chad. This is really important for everybody. I mean, the thing on the top of all our minds is climate change, the make or break decade, where the worst impacts of climate change can just be um, devastating if we don't keep carbon stored in ecosystems where it's stored. So we were really lucky. We had some uh, researcher approach us and said, hey. Uh, we had done a study on over the, the biodiversity, overlap of waves and biodiversity, found out that about, as uh, the announcer said when she opened, Claudia, about 75% of the world's best waves are in areas of high biodiversity. Last year, we published a paper on the overlap of high carbon ecosystems and waves. And about 4,800 waves mapped. That's how I knew the number. Um, I'm not that nerdy. It was because of the paper. Um, and, and we found about 100 million tons of carbon stored in the ecosystems, forests and mangroves, around 4,800 waves within a kilometer of those waves. You expand it to three kilometers, it becomes 200 million tons. 200 million tons is 2% of the energy emissions of the world in a year. Think about that. All energy, all those NFTs burning, that, those 200 million tons, it's 2% of it. If you go out to the watersheds, so these are big, but they are manageable, you get a billion tons. 10% of the global energy emission, uh, carbon emissions from energy production in a year could be kept in the ecosystems if we protect the 4,800 waves of the world. That can be done. Um, well, one question for all of you uh, before we get to audience questions, which is, okay, what's two? <laughs> I want two. I want two surf spots. One local in LA that people can go to, and then one one around the world that's the, your favorite surf spot. I'll start myself uh, for it in, in Newport Beach, 40th Street, uh, Jetties, River Jetties, um, and then and then uh, in Kauai, PKs. Uh, go. Se secret spots. <laughs> secret spots are preferred. Secret spots. Um, <laughs> uh, there's not that uh, many people here. I just got back from Sumba. Pinnacles in Sumba with the local kids. Unreal. And one day it was 15 foot. Um, the kids weren't out with us that day. Um, uh, places around in L.A. Um, I've been enjoying, believe it or not, you, people are going to be like, what? The, the sandbar is lined up really well at Venice uh, uh, Breakwater <laughs> this summer. <laughs> what? They were really good. They were really, it was really good. So don't give up on L.A. yet. Awesome. Trestles, obviously. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a great place, great wave. Proud to have saved it. Uh, my other favorite spots are down on the Oaxacan coast of mainland Mexico. It's just a spectacular coastline, big scale resources, and still pretty intact and, and great surf. Awesome. Do you have like local spots? Or oh, God. The first, the, as we were talking about in the beginning, these guys put me on the spot. They were like, what's the first, uh, the most memorable or first surfing experience? And I would say, one of the first ones I had was at Troncones. So Troncones, uh, Mexico. Yeah. And the other would be um, probably um, at the Rockaways. Oh, yeah, nice. <laughs> I have to <laughs> shout out to New York. Uh, yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, let's go have some audience. Do we have any audience questions? The Hammer folks? Oh, I'm not. I've been instructed that yeah, maybe on the you, third on the you, third panel, I will not point at people. You can't look, put your hand I over know, your yeah, eyes. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> Hi guys, question about the um, the reef NFT idea. So you said that's something that you could sell, that you are selling, and that it could appreciate in value. How does that NFT appreciate? The NFT appreciates through. Sorry, the one you, the ones that you were talking about over here. Yeah, um, Michael 
Prob Michael knows more about NFTs than I do, so you go with this one, and I'll add. Um, I, you might. It sounds like you have some familiarity with how they they do profit, but I mean, ours basically appreciates through trading, right? So it appreciates through kind of um, unmetricizable on one level. Hopefully, the project value. So it's all about value, right? Value for our NFT right now might be considered an NFT in crypto terms to be dead in the water because it's not really appreciating a lot. People are holding it, though, because it has value on other levels. So it has a high percentage of original holders, very few attrition. Those that gave up on it early were probably speculating. And those that are holding are holding. It's over 30%, I think, of the original, which is not a bad number for an NFT. So it's kind of like the value, hopefully, is increasing through art. So the, the kind of appreciation of it might um, take a, a number of different faces, a number of different manifestations. It might be purely financial. And it might be in that it helps spawn other NFTs. It might be that it spawns further conversation. And it might be that that morphs or grows. As it is, the project, our project itself, has metadata that's been frozen right now. So we're sitting on a live project. We stopped its growth, but we could reignite it if the DAO, the community that owns the whole project, if we all agree by vote, we could open it up and have it grow again, in which case it might become, again, another live project. So. There's a kind of, I don't know, maybe that's a good segue into what I, I see is so fascinating about what you were mentioning, um, Scott. Yeah, yeah, and just like anything that's traded in that market, every time it's traded, value goes back to the original creator, um, which is great. That's a rare, rare thing. And um, in this particular case, and I'm not an expert on it, it wasn't my project, but it's a project that I hope to do in the surf conservation space in, in time, um, you know, you've got a you've got a finite resource. Uh, New Way has got a lot of coral reef, but you do have a finite resource. As it's traded more and more, the value increases uh, because there's more demand and there's less of a less of a product of, out there. If somebody decides to sell it, again, it generates income for back to the uh, originator. So it's a we did the math. The math was done that if we sold all the NFTs for New Way's reefs they would be able to create a trust fund such that they would be able to, to, with just common interest in a normal investment account, be able to protect the place into perpetuity. So the math was done for that. And what I think is just, and just like uh, jumping in for my two cents, you know, w w um, a lot of these projects are based on aligned interests, you know, and, and a collective agreement to create value, right? And so, only to answer the question in a more art, I guess, art angled way, you know, if people, it's not like there's a direct correlation with the biodiversity credits and the U.S. dollar, for example, right? There is a goodwill system associated with the fact that we are all collectively getting together to trade these things because we believe that the output of this ecosystem and resource has value and we care about it and we're going to trade amongst ourselves to do that. And I think that that's something that is for, for at least NFTs that have some type of greater good. I find that to be the most powerful argument for us to all participate, you know, because we're not just trying to go get a PFP or do some sort of, you know, uh, really, really disposable, you know, meaningless uh, thing. There's, you know, it's tied to the, to the reason that way. So. Um, another question. Sorry, I poked. I sorry, Hammer. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, so you know, maybe I'm just being really blockheaded about this, but I, I just uh, I'm I, I'm trying to make the connection between this uh, NFT and this enterprise of preserving the waves and preserving wave sites and surfing sites. Uh, why do you even need the NFT? I mean, uh, and first of all, I look at art as uh, something that is not so, simply a matter of uh, something that's collectible or tradable or um, monetizable, although it can be all those things that can be wonderful, um, but as something th that has a community impact that potentially as if, if you're looking in terms of you know uh, trading up that should have global impact that should have that should have import in and of itself so 
um, can you give us any examples of, of these NFTs that you can share? Or are they simply you know, embedded in some kind of like blockchain? And speaking of that aspect of the NFT, of the blockchain, what exactly is its carbon footprint? Because that, I think, is relevant, and we should know about that. I mean, uh, this is something that I see in the architectural domain. You know, these vast complexes given over to, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, basically electronic computing to uh, compute the next crypto coin, the next, you know, whatever. You know, uh, that is blockchain. It's, it's a little bit more sophisticated than that. It's like AI, blockchain, all of it. Um, you know, I, I am expecting to see something. I want to see something that is open to the community for discussion. So uh, can, uh, can you show us any examples? I, we've got a screen here. I want to look at shit. <laughs> I, I want to look at stuff. <laughs> well, to rewind to the beginning of the presentation, Michael did show an example of his NFTs, those okay, crystals. Yeah. Okay, yeah. The uh, images were NFTs. All right, and, and I, have an, I have a question about that, too. Okay, great. Can I answer uh, the first question? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay, I get, I, and I look. I, you ask a lot of questions, and they're all very valid. And 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 you know, we. Try, I guess I was trying to proactively um, provoke some of those questions because they're very valid questions. They're things that we've had conversations about, and um, and and uh, a lot of people do. Uh, I will say. At the base level, the reason why this experiment is was important for me and for us to put into the show and to display it is so that we could have a public convening, is so that we could have this conversation about the merits of the system, right? So this, the, you are participating in the first, you know, in a not first, but in a generative public forum for us to uh, have a conversation about this, right? Um, at the biggest level. Conservation is hard also because there's not a lot of resources available. And so the NFT projects that I've experimented with, that micro, uh, Michael's experimenting with for these projects, is it's not super easy to convince people to expend their resources and you know, hard-earned you know, revenue or economy into projects that have uh, appreciable social value. Right, and, and I think that in Michael's example, what was provocative to me was that there was an NFT project that, and, and again, we'll, I'm gonna you know, um, untether a few of your questions together. Also, but these are vital global resources. These are vital resources that which, are which fundamental are the corals or the, or electricity? sustaining life. What, what, you're talking about the corals or the electricity? Uh, b you know, life in yeah, the exactly, ocean, exactly. life so, as a, uh, the ocean. Exactly. So, so my, my, again, my conversation back in, into this is to say this experiment that we, I experienced that we are, we felt important to present to the public was to use a technological invention to create resources, to inspire people to uh, donate or give or buy or however you you know uh, uh, describe the transaction of owning and grabbing an NFT in order to channel resources into life, right? Think things that so money that people had that they would otherwise buy a board ape yacht club or they would otherwise buy some other speculative NFT that is literally just a image on Twitter. Instead of buying that. If you buy Michaels, you're supporting not only an, an artist who is trying to experiment with this and putting himself at risk to do that vulnerably to have questions like this that are, are very, you know, again, valid. But what you're also doing is you're actually spending your resources to actually fund Cliff and John and the team over at uh, the lab to go do that. And so that is the nature of what that experiment was. And, and I would just say to Michael too, and for everyone, and, and again, I, I, I wanna make sure that I, I, I am thanking you as well. This is the conversation that we need to have about these things because all of this stuff has stakes. Right, and I would say, you know, the vulnerability that Michael has as an artist to be there, and 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 for us to even do this and have this conversation is something that is also I want to not diminish. So thank you for for for, for being here for that. But and thank you for for that question. I hope that helps. Well, I, I want to add to that too. Like you said, I mean, you're probably raising millions for your project, and you need billions to do it globally. You know, I, I spend a ton of my time raising money to try to do the work we're doing, and we we have single digit percentages of the money we need as a conservation collective to do, solve the problems we have. And so I think when I think about this, like 
all the conventional ways of raising money, we're going to still be doing every day. So I don't think there's any like suggestion that this is an alternative to all the other things we're up to. This is just, in my mind, just a sort of new way to provoke the thinking that you just talked about. So I think it's like we're going to still be getting grants and talking to major donors and working with corporations and getting government grants and doing all of those things. And this is just... A, and if we can get a bunch of uh, sort of these, you know, these kids on Discord to be thinking about coral reefs, to me that's interesting because maybe I can get some of them to show up and plant some. Yeah. In, in well, Indonesia. and then to, to add that, you know, just to expose a conversation we were having over dinner, um, where grants come from, also that money is not in any pure state necessarily, uh, uh, you know, in ways. And you were talking about big grants, I won't say the name, but your big grants that you guys turned down because you did the vetting of the cycle and it just wasn't money that you wanted as part of the movement, you know? And so, um, again, the history of social change has been through complicated conversations like this. And, and, and I don't think there's ever a winner because there's never a right pure path. Um, but again, I would say on behalf of Mika and myself for the show, it, it is important for us to put together and put out into the world ideas that may take hold, may, um, be, you know, evolve into something uh, that that does have clear clear answers, um, but yeah, it all starts with artists. Yeah, uh, I really appreciate the question as well. I mean, and its challenges, which are something you know, not not to try to make excuses, but that we've we thought about a lot. And in many ways, for me, I'm also not challenging the idea that NFTs, you know, not their question as art or whether they would be my art or replace art, but I wanted to participate. I think in that um, arena to see if it could be used as a medium to try to mobilize it in a way that I thought might be in my terms, a little bit more constructive or pointed towards something I cared about and was learning to care about. And it's also like in a lot of my forays in the work that I do, um, I have a sustained engagement with all the places that I've worked in. And it's, it's very, it's educational and it inspires a lot of the other work I do. So it, in a way, it's part of my process. So this project, in a way, for me, had a lot of meaning because it not only kind of engendered that, but it had a kind of quality that it could keep unfolding and potentially generate more I guess we were talking about value, maybe more outcomes, other things that might be even be outside of my practice. So I found that kind of potentially a generative space. It's still unknown to me too. You know, I don't have it figured out, and I haven't cashed out of it, for instance, or anything. We're like really like you know, I'm still invested in it, although I don't hover around the NFT market and I don't follow the Discord anymore. I tap in and I deliver messages to the community so we, they know it's alive, but. There's a lot of it that I think has potential, but you know, and that's why I'm still kind of around the space and in this conversation. So I'm actually invigorated to hear, you know, that you also see potential, you know, Scott, that you've been talking about it and thinking about it in different ways, you know, Chad. And so, and obviously, you know, Glenn said that he, you know, looked to me and came to me for NFT kind of advice in the beginning. He quickly eclipsed me in like two <laughs> seconds because he turned it into action and really was always geared towards that action. So you know, it's a little bit of a different practice. So he took it also, I think, in a different way as material and medium. And that's what the potential he saw in it. So I've, I found it potentially ripe as an art material. But is it resolved? I, I don't think so. And I don't think, I don't think I'm, I'm not here to ask, answer the, ask the question whether it is or isn't art. But I am curious, can we take resources, materials, and try to kind of convert them, try to kind of re repurpose them, look at them in different ways? Yeah, just very briefly, I think what's so cool about it is you can create a value with something that people recognize artistically and it directs that value, part of that value, into conservation. So all the money we get was created in totally different ways. Like this is a complete new way of creating money for conservation. Never done before. And Michael's done it and we've done it. Um, now maybe we'll do that together. We'll see. But I think, you know, we, um, uh, Glenn, I think you said at the beginning, you know, the, the ocean conservation space is the least invested in, the least. So we damn well better come up with new ways to generate money. So that said, we've got to be careful of the greenhouse gas emission foot and the carbon footprint. Uh, we have chosen purposely to work on a, um, and I'm not the technology expert here. I'm the surfer conservation guy, so I just know about the project a little bit. <laughs> but um, we've we've chosen one of the lowest carbon um, impact 
systems in terms of the blockchain, in terms of we work with Ripple, um, you know, people can check that out. But um, yeah, so I, creating new ways to generate money for conservation as long as it doesn't have a perverse uh, impact is, you know, and we're careful of that is, you know, I'm all for it. We have one time for one more question. Or do we have another question? Hello, hi. Um, so first of all, I'm so happy that I came to this because this has been such a fascinating and just like enlightening conversation. I don't surf, but I love the water. I love the islands and have visited a few places that you guys mentioned. And I wrote my question down so I get it right. But I have something, when it comes to being in these places and visiting um, endangered areas like this, I'm constantly thinking about the people and how they're affected by climate change. And I was just wondering at like the conservation camps that you have for the surf camps and like the work at the mega lab and all the areas that were mentioned that have, that, that's like the 4,800 best wave sites. How are your orgs um, protecting those people, um, the native and indigenous people um, through your efforts and things like that from climate change through these you know, yeah, all the efforts that all of your organizations do and, you know, constantly are in, you know, their face up with kind of thing. Do you want to take it from the surf side of the question? Yeah, I can start. I mean, uh, we're fundamentally a community-based conservation organization, so we are very conscious about dropping into any location and kind of doing conservation. We, we try to engage with the locals in any place we work and work with them so they do the, the conservation with our support. So our premise is uh, we support locals in doing conservation. And we have the advantage of resources and science and know-how and knowledge that we can sort of bring in, but we try to make it locally led. So that that's our philosophy. So the goal is that we can leave these places better than we found them and hopefully leave the people in the communities uh, with with new tools and ways of thinking and doing so that they can have a, you know, for example, a less extractive and a more sustainable economy and still uh, make enough money to f feed their family and put their kids through school. And so we're just, we're trying to just kind of help out, but not be sort of top down in any way. And it's easy to get that wrong. Don't get, you know, as, as sort of like, you know, this Western white organization. So we have to be super careful about that. And I wouldn't say we haven't made mistakes, but that's the intent. Yeah, yeah. And very much to that same point, we work in the same way. We facilitate local communities to identify issues that are of concern to them related to the environment, food security, um, tourism, income, and uh, we've been fortunate enough to have a lot of good solutions that have worked in other places of the world. So very often we actually, we facilitate, we support, but we actually get communities together with one another, ones that have been successful before with other ones that, you know, are interested in embarking on this journey. And the reality is, is that for most of the world, most of the places where we work, it can be managed well. You can restore the mangroves, you can restore the reefs, you can get the fish populations to a state to where it can feed the local population. You can create a local surf economy that doesn't bring in these really negative elements. It's just a matter of spending the time with the local communities to see if they would like to embark on that journey. And if they do, um, always putting them first, like Chad said, always following them, but giving them examples of success that um, allow them to see something beyond the shores that they've been familiar with. Um, and, you know, already I'll just say uh, in Moratai in Indonesia, that place where we're soon to get to 25 surf protected areas, the fishermen have a 15% incre increase in fish catch over the last two years of the project, which is so significant for them in terms of food security and income that they said, you know, we don't need to do other jobs. We, we're so happy with that. Um, other people are wanting to do, you know, surf guiding and other things to work in the surf economy. But that happened really because all we did was set aside some small areas where some fish could reproduce and, and make bigger fish. And so they got better catch. Really simple biology and not something, you know, perverse and, you know, where people had to sacrifice. Actually, within a very short time, people were benefiting. That can't doesn't necessarily happen everywhere, but it can happen in these really highly productive marine ecosystem. So uh, your question is so important, the sensitivity to that. If we don't do that, we're, we're out. We'd never coerce or 
um, say, you know, this is what you should do. It's always about empowering the local communities to see a path that they might not have known about before. And um, yeah, it's been it's been really great so far, and you know, really appreciate the question. Yeah, I mean, for my own part, I just wanted to also say, reiterate that that's a really a huge, huge, huge question. It's ultimately that impact on the communities is what this is all about as well. You know, it's about people, it is about communities, and it is about the locations that these take place in. So, but for my part, I would also add that you know, the Mega Lab itself, our collaborators, helpers, friends, colleagues. And we don't have any kind of official partnerships, or nor do we fund them. They are independent and fund themselves. That said, their work is so amazing in the arena that you're talking about that I don't feel comfortable entirely speaking for them. So if you could look up the work of the Mega Lab um, online, um, on uh, both the web and on Instagram, and also of Cliff Capono himself, who you know not only is a master surfer, amazing surfer. And, um, but is also, as a scientist and activist, incredibly active in his local Hawaiian community, and his work is, is all over the place. He recently did an amazing talk with a colleague, a scientist colleague of his on a TED Talk, and you can find that probably, you know, key, queued right up at the top of the TED Talk. So please watch that as well, and you'll get to a sense of how they're as scientists and surfers kind of trying to work in that, work in that realm and address those issues. Um, well, thank you. I will let's just say, uh, Chad said it, uh, I think, a few seconds ago, but, you know, one of the things that, uh, for this show is we're trying to, you know, um, think about extraction and, and just put projects and put ideas forward that are generative and, you know, combat the notion of extraction. But uh, thank you again so much for being here and having this conversation. Uh, we really appreciate you. Thank you to, to all you guys and uh, uh, appreciate you guys. Thank you.